Hi, my name is Dave Robbins. Uh, thanks for joining us for this discussion on operation and maintenance at fecal sludge management facilities. I am based in Colorado in the United States, but for the last 10 years I've been working in Asia, mostly in the Philippines and other Southeast Asian countries, and a little bit in China. My primary role is in helping local governments to develop their own fecal sludge management programs, and operation and maintenance plays an important role in that. My general view is that operation and maintenance is absolutely critical in ensuring that facilities are functioning properly. And when possible, operations should be considered at the earliest stages of the inception of the program, and designers and engineers should take into account the operational realities when they're designing these facilities. This is the fecal sludge treatment plant at Dumaguete City, Philippines. It uses the technology known as waste stabilization ponds to treat the septage. I'm using this example to make the simple point that it doesn't really matter what the technology is. Many of the overall concepts for proper operation and maintenance you'll find are the same. Four of the categories I'd like to discuss today include operation and maintenance planning, record keeping, organizational activities, which is really about who is going to do what when, and monitoring. Let's look at the first one, operation and maintenance planning right now. Every facility should have an operation and maintenance plan. Many jurisdictions require that a completed operational and maintenance plan be submitted along with the engineered designs in order to obtain a permit for the facility. At a minimum, the operation and maintenance plan should consider the tasks that are required to keep the facility running and how often those tasks should be performed. The O&M plan will include information on the operations tasks for each different component of the treatment plant the procedures for conducting the tasks, the frequency, who will conduct the task, how the tasks will be conducted safely, and how they will be monitored to prove that the outcome of the task was effective. Many of the tasks involve cleaning, as in these trash screens at the Dumaguete Treatment Plant's receiving station. And this is one example of how smart design can simplify operations. So once it's screened out, uh, some, of the uh, some of the sludge or the uh, solids goes to the bottom. And on uh, uh, a weekly basis, they take uh, uh, the bulk of it and they send it to the drying bed. You can see we have two uh, receiving stations here. Uh, we did this for redundancy or uh, so one, when one is being uh, operated, the other can be maintained. This image is of a similar screening facility up in San Fernando, La Union in the northern part of the Philippines. And it illustrates how the tipping mechanism works on this screen. It's actually connected by a hinge, which makes lifting and cleaning very easy for the operators. Operators have to remember the screenings that they collect should be managed as solid waste and stored in covered containers until disposed. Routine tasks such as cleaning of screens or performing landscape maintenance is the job of the housekeeping crew. When adjustments are needed to the plant that impacts on how it functions, that's the job of the operators. And making repairs or adjusting the physical facilities is done by the maintenance staff. We have three technicians, then the other six is for the construction and maintenance. Then the ten is for housekeeping. The staffing requirements will be different at each septage treatment plant. A lot will depend on the size and the nature of the technology. In some instances, people may share jobs. This is how I will show to you how we receive the manifest form. The 
the security guard will have to present a logbook for them to have the time, they have to put the time, and they have to sign the, at the logbook by the time they arrive in the plant. And then after they have the log, the log to the guard, they have to show to us the dislodging form. Mm. The dislodging form came from the, our main office with the control number inspection and then the techni our technician receives the dislodging form and check on the volume. Operator logbooks are legal documents that should be kept for at least five years. Good operators use the logbook to note down changes in the operational procedures that they use at the plant so that they can go back later on in time and see how those impacted the overall operations. There are some exciting innovations in this area of operation and maintenance. One is electronic receiving stations, complete with flow meters, which are shown here. Another is GPS-enabled scheduling and even smartphone or tablet data entry. For larger septage treatment plants, human resources is an important consideration. Job descriptions inform the employee what their responsibilities are, who they report to, and the special conditions of their employment. Job descriptions are written documents that are signed by the employees. They specify the roles and responsibilities that will be required, the do's and don'ts, any safety and special limitations that the job has, as well as the reporting structure. Personal protection equipment is the gear that keeps you safe. Let's see how all these guys comply. Take a look at the worker on the left. Those tennis shoes are really not the best gear for this type of job. We would certainly recommend rubber boots or other waterproof footwear. But notice that both of the workers are wearing protective gloves and they do have their face masks on, but Likely, they should also be wearing some splash-proof gear. Fecal sludge is infectious material, but management can do a lot to help keep workers safe. They can install hand wash stations around key locations at the plant and encourage good hygiene behaviors. They can also provide immunizations, including hepatitis A, hepatitis B, and tetanus. Drowning hazards are real concerns at fecal sludge treatment facilities where they use lagoons. At a minimum, management should have buoys with ropes, long poles with hooks, and even a boat could be useful. There is often a wide array of electrical equipment at a fecal sludge treatment plant. Management should take the risk of electrocution very seriously. There's one method that's utilized called the lockout tagout rule that should be considered. The lockout tagout rule is a means of keeping the power off to equipment that's going to be worked on. A lock and a tag is affixed to the breaker in the off position and a note made in the operator's logbook. It's only when that work is completed and the mechanic signs off that that can be re-energized by opening the breaker again. Unfortunately, every year, sewage workers die from confined space injuries. What happens is that in a confined space, the atmosphere can become compromised, either toxic or anoxic. In these conditions, if a worker is not properly prepared, they can quickly succumb. These accidents often lead to multiple fatalities. A confined space permit program can limit the risks. Workers first test the atmosphere in the confined space and then don the proper personal protective equipment before entering the space. Using the buddy system, they work together to make sure that both remain safe. And if there's a problem, the one on top can pull the other in the space to safety. Laboratory and chemical safety is a final concern I'd like to talk about today. If your fecal sludge treatment plant is fortunate enough to have its own laboratory, certain procedures should be in place to keep the workers in the laboratory safe. Fecal sludge facilities can have all sorts of hazards. Additional ones include chemical hazards from sampling and analysis, and also hazards from the chemicals that are on site as part of the treatment process. This might include hydrated lime for using the lime stabilization process, 
or different types of reagents used in laboratory analysis. I am the physical chem analyst of the water district, Dumaguete City Water District Laboratory. BOD, the C uh, COD, TDS, TSS, uh, especially uh, for our own products and uh, effluent of our city septage treatment plant. I am Cherise. Christy D. Paling, I am the laboratory head. So we are a multi-service facility laboratory. We are the first um, accre DOH accredited laboratory in um, Negros Oriental. For the Dumaguete City program, laboratory personnel prepares the sampling bottles, often containing reagents of sulfuric or nitric acid. These are toxic and dangerous to the workers, so training is required. Uh, we go to the first pond, uh, the liquid part that, uh, and some of the organics that pass through the screening part overflows in this anaerobic pond. Uh, you will notice that uh, immediately you can see a receiving uh, or uh, uh, a, a baffle uh, there to avoid the entry of the liquid from, to the surface. It's actually uh, at the lower bottom, around 0.6 meters from, from the surface water. Uh, this component is very essential because uh, a big part of the organic load is taken out uh, and uh, treated in this area. Uh, to do the maintenance of this, uh, every now and then, uh, in a period of uh, roughly, uh, especially, uh, if it's been used for over one and a half year, uh, you need to measure the depth of the slot deposited at the bottom. Uh, because once it's about a third uh, of the height filled up, you need to get the sludge deposited and send this to the drying bed. Uh, uh, there's a sludge pump, non-clog uh, uh, type, that uh, used to uh, be a, uh, the equipment to be used for transferring. But uh, at this point in time, they're using the a vacuum pump of the the truck uh, since it's very powerful and uh, uh, they can transfer the sludge from here. Uh, the proper maintenance of this uh, anaerobic pump is uh, you need to also uh, uh, observe if there are presence of mosquitoes and a larvicide, uh, an appropriate one, can be sprayed on top uh, so the, the, to avoid the spread of this one. With your naked eye and a little bit of practice, you can learn to identify larvae on your ponds. That's the only time when a larvicide should be used. And remember, never use oil or kerosene to kill mosquitoes. And uh, every now and then, they need to clean also uh, the fapol because uh, scum and sludge gets to be deposited in those areas. At my back uh, are the sludge drying bed, we call it. Uh, this uh, 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 receives the sludge deposited from the anaerobic pond, and as well as uh, some of the uh, grit and sand that was taken out from the receiving area. Uh, as you can see, uh, this tank actually consists of layers of gravel and sand. Uh, down at the bottom, there's an under drain, a perforated one, uh, running across at the middle. So the filtrate, uh, meaning the water that uh, uh, part of the slurry, uh, is sent back to the anaerobic pond. While uh, uh, the sludge uh, I, I, uh, is uh, let alone to be dried using uh, 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 natural means, the sunshine. But for rainy places, uh, we can put some uh, transparent roofing uh, so it will not be affected by during uh, rainy days. In tropical environments, it takes between two and three weeks to dewater sludge to the point that it can be removed by a shovel. Operators should keep track of how long it does take to dry the sludge 
This might be an indication of clogging of the sand, which is a problem that can be easily fixed just by scraping the top two or three centimeters. And uh, you can see, you spread the sludge evenly, roughly from eight inches to 12 inches at the most. Uh, so uh, you let it stay there for uh, two weeks, uh, then uh, uh, you can, w once you notice that it's already dry, uh, you, you, you can take them out, spade them out, and uh, some does it by putting in, inside a, a socks. Uh, the, 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 some others, they stockpile it in some areas. Uh, this, however, uh, needs to be uh, uh, stuck for a while, especially if we're not disinfecting it. We need to uh, uh, keep it for at least four to six months uh, to be safe uh, before it can be used for uh, 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 a soil conditioner. Uh, this is a portion of the sludge that has been st stored here for a while. And uh, uh, this is relatively like soil. Uh, uh, when, once it's already stabilized, it doesn't smell. And uh, uh, storing it for quite some time and you can make use of it as a good soil conditioner. From time to time, the surface scum on ponds should be removed and placed into the sand drying beds. It looks like they've gone a little bit too long in this instance. Letting the scum stay on the pond can create problems with odors and mosquitoes. Right at my back is the second stage anaerobic pond, but uh, two more tanks uh, will be uh, uh, very close to the facultative pond, which I'm going to talk about. The anaerobic ponds, uh, so a little background there, is about three meters deep. Uh, the difference in the, the, the facultative pond, it, this is around 1.5 to 2 meters. Uh, so you can see the difference. Uh, uh, in the anaerobic pond, uh, uh, we don't allow much of the sunlight getting in through, while in the facultative pond, uh, we allow much of the sunlight uh, so that the uh, algae uh, can, uh, uh, through, 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 through symbiotic relationship with the bacteria that uh, digested the uh, organics and the carbon dioxide, uh, they get to produce through photosynthetic action uh, oxygen, while the bacteria down beneath uh, uh, needs the uh, oxygen and they get to multiply and do the stabilization. So the facultative pond is a bit bigger than the anaerobic pond. And to do maintenance of this is, uh, you can see from the background, uh, part of this is trimming the, trimming the grasses, especially if uh, you're not lined with the concrete as this one, and uh, uh, some, some of the roots uh, gets into the uh, tank and possibly cause uh, uh, entry of uh, rodents as well. Compared to the anaerobic pond, uh, this is uh, less frequently the sludge, uh, five years to 10 years, uh, but that depends on the loading. This is a subsurface planted gravel filter. What it meant is that uh, Actually, liquid is flowing from that end, leading to the outfall. Uh, it's just beneath the uh, gravel surface. Uh, the good thing about this is uh, uh, you don't have much growth of mosquitoes, and, and, and the flowers adds up also to the beauty of the site. Uh, in many places, they're using reed beds, uh, cattails, uh, and some other plants that uh, gets to introduce oxygen through their root system. And, uh, and to do maintenance of this, uh, every so often you need to take out uh, those dyed leaves, uh, you, you need to clean it up. And uh, once it started to be a little clogged up, you can also uh, 
flush it out by, uh, by, by uh, raising the water level at the outlet. Uh, in such manner, uh, the water level uh, goes up, so much of the solids or the uh, dirt uh, can be taken out and be captured towards the end. You might notice that uh, there are bubbles in between. Uh, back then, uh, many years ago, when we were uh, designing the concept of this one, actually there's another pond uh, uh, supposed to be built in here. But uh, uh, initially we're talking of uh, doing uh, disinfection naturally, uh, everything. But then uh, taking out that pond, uh, I decided to put one uh, chlorination contact tank. Uh, this will uh, uh, give us an assurance that uh, somehow if there's are still left uh, microbes uh, or, or, or infectious liquid getting out, uh, a, a, close, uh, a, a chlorine uh, uh, can be injected either using liquid or pallet type. Uh, uh, exposing it for 15 to 30 minutes contact time, uh, this will surely cut, uh, take out the bugs. For this all-natural system at Dumaguete, most of the tasks are related to housekeeping and keeping the landscape in good shape. As plants become more mechanized, more of the tasks are related to operations and adjusting the process flow so that the treatment plant works better and consistently, less on housekeeping. Uh, the overflow from the gravel filter goes to the wetland. This wetland simulates a uh, uh, natural uh, environment of uh, the, uh, uh, the pond where, where there's also uh, a liquid component on top of the surface. Uh, this also serves as like a, an aerated pond, uh, no aeration, but because this is very shallow, the wind the action causes introduction of oxygen. Uh, they intentionally made it beautiful and they put landscaping around the area. And this also uh, cleanses further the liquid already filtered from the planted gravel filter. You probably noticed that plenty of trees are planted all over the area. Uh, this adds up to the beauty of the place. This also gets to capture the carbon dioxide and some of the methane that uh, uh, evaporates in the air. And this serve, serves as a buffer also from the neighboring houses uh, so as not to be appended of the odor. Right now, I'm taking a sample uh, of the treated water that comes out from the facility. Uh, uh, you might notice that this is kind of greenish, uh, but it's actually clear. Uh, reason for this is the algae fermentation, uh, pigmentation, but it doesn't smell, it doesn't smell, and uh, this has the quality of around less than 10 VOD milligram per liter, and this is good enough for uh, uh, cleaning, uh, washing the loan, or irrigation system, and even for flushing toilets. So, 
uh, when uh, it reaches the river body of water, it will not affect the uh, marine, uh, 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 the animals living in the area. The type and frequency of the tests required will be determined during the permitting process. It will be different for each plant. Important though for most plants are an indication of the effluent quality in terms of microbiological activity. Fecal coliform, total coliform, and E. coli tests are quite common. At Dumaguete, they do the total coliform test. If there's a changes in the color because there's an indicator uh, included in the sample and the medium, it changes in color, it indicates uh, bacterial presence. Well, thanks for joining me for this discussion on operation and maintenance. I uh, hope you found it interesting. And just remember, if you're not going to operate it, don't build it. Thanks very much and have a great day.